so we had to keep the fish inside. And he pushed me off and I broke my collarbone. They heard strange noises in the night and one of them was scared. It's time for The Apple Seed, a show filled with all kinds of stories for you and your family. And we're not talking about news stories, we're talking about tall tales, fairy tales, folk tales, personal and family stories. Stories teach us who we are and what we believe. And here at The Apple Seed, we love to imagine you sharing your story with the people who are important to you. In fact, we hope the stories we bring you here on the show help you to do just that. I'm your host, Sam Payne, and today we've got an hour of stories for you about making your place in the world. If you've ever moved to a new town or started at a new school, you know what it's like to feel like you don't belong, at least at first, right? And that can hurt a little bit, can't it? When you're nervous about showing up at a new school or a new job or even a new family. For those of us who have step parents and siblings or step kids. Sometimes you can feel like a fish out of water. Sometimes in a new place, it's even easy to imagine that everyone is slightly disappointed with who you are, or maybe even upset that you're there at all. But if you've been there, you also know that you don't have to be a victim to those circumstances. There are a lot of things you can do to help carve out a useful place in that new space, whatever that space is. You've heard of Jackie Robinson, right? Number 42 for the Brooklyn Dodgers, the first black player to play in Major League Baseball after 60 years of segregation. Jackie Robinson faced harassment and insults from people in the stands and other players, including his own teammates in that new space that he was in. He was even targeted for rough physical play leading to injuries during games, but Robinson, encouraged by a few others and fueled, of course, by his own inner strength, continued to play his best, and he was awarded Rookie of the Year by the league. And eventually, he made his place on the team and in the history books and led the way for other great baseball players like Satchel Paige and Hank Aaron to play Major League Baseball. Desegregation was difficult for America, and the burden was carried by people like Jackie Robinson. And their stories, stories of people who entered a new space and made room for themselves there, inspire us to take a challenging situation and make the best of it. Well, we've got some stories like that for you today. People who feel like they don't belong, but then create a space for themselves. And in fact, make things better for the communities they join. And first up, we have Geraldine Buckley sharing how she became a chaplain at Maryland's largest male prison. Shouldn't be a female chaplain. It says in the word that a woman shouldn't have authority over a man. I don't want a female chaplain. That's Geraldine Buckley, and that's how people felt about her when she first arrived on the job. But you'll hear a great story of how she carved out a place for herself on today's episode. And after that, an actual old-time radio drama adaptation of Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, adapted by the Ford Theater, not that Ford Theater, by the way, after World War II. If you don't know, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court is a novel about a straight-talking, time-traveling American who tries to right what he sees as the wrongs of medieval England, long before England was even England, with all kinds of tech gadgets up his sleeves. I showed them my watch. Oh, it is well, marvelous. It's an infernal machine. It's amazing. I flashed my pocket lighter. Have a care. He holds a fire in his hand. It is a magical torch. Even my jokes panicked him. Uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> <laughs> A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Now, the original Mark Twain story is a piece of imaginative American literary history. And the radio drama we're going to share with you today is a kick, too, from the golden age of radio dramas. People were listening to it on the radio in 1947. It's a piece of radio storytelling history. We're excited for our show today, so let's plunge right in with storyteller Geraldine Buck and her autobiographical tale called Tea in the Slammer. Thank you so much. 
Well, when I was in my early 30s living in London, I had a Damascus Road experience. I fell irrevocably in love with the Lord. I realized that he was who he said he was. I gave up my PR business, went to Bible school and became a minister. And I never thought that becoming a minister would land me in prison. <laughs> and it did. Many years later, in 2007, I became the Protestant chaplain at the largest men's prison in Maryland. Now, it was not my idea to become the Protestant chaplain at the largest men's prison in Maryland. No, it was not. I was asked. First of all, it was by Marcus. He was the inmate pastor. There's a very vibrant church of 600 men called Grace Church behind the walls. They've even got a seminary all paid for by outside funds. And I'd volunteered in the church and he asked me. And then a person who played a pivotal role in the prison administration, they asked me several times to apply. And then my pastor told me he thought I should apply. And I thought to myself, are they crazy? Can't they see I am not prison chaplain material? I'm creative. I'm a free spirit. I can't be bound by bars. <laughs> but of course, I didn't say that to them. I told them all I'd pray about it. And when I did, I thought, oh, no, this is a God thing. And I felt like a, an old war horse sniffing the next battle, sniffing the blood. But I did what many people would do in that situation. Many probably here have already done it. When you're faced with a situation you know is going to be difficult, you know is going to be bloody, but you just plunge in anyway. And that's exactly what I did. So I applied for the job and I got it. But it was a government position, so it was frozen for some months. And during that time, a new prison opened on the other side of the state in Cumberland, and they took all the leaders of that 600-man church, all the leaders. So the pastor, the assistant pastor, the head of the deacon's board, the head of the minister's board, the head of the choirs, they moved all of those leaders to that new prison. Well, the remaining inmate congregation were in shock, and they were also grieving the loss of their last chaplain, who was an African-American pastor. He'd been in the position for 16 years. He'd started the church. So at the beginning and end of services, men would gather and they'd glower. And I'd hear them say things like, don't want a woman chaplain. Shouldn't be a female chaplain. It says in the word that a woman shouldn't have authority over a man. I don't want a female chaplain. Well, as you can imagine, this got a little old. And so at the end of the, one of the services, I addressed the congregation and I said, gentlemen, I said, I believe you all know that the Lord has put a great love for you in my heart. And all over that room, men nodded because they knew that was true. And I said, I believe you know that within the confines of the law, I would do anything I could to help you. And again, all over that room, there were nods because they knew that was true too. I said, well, gentlemen, there are two things I can't do for you. I can't be a man and I can't be black, so get over it. <laughs> and, and they too had the grace to laugh. <laughs> but the prison, the prison, uh, the guards, the, the prison officers, the, they didn't want, the correctional officers, they didn't want me either. Often when I came into the facility, there would be little knots of officers and I'd hear them muttering things like, I don't want a female chaplain. It's not right. It's a safety issue. It's not safe to have a female chaplain. I don't want a woman chaplain. And if any of them said it to my face, which they did, I would say, officer, it wasn't my idea. Take it up with the almighty. <laughs> but I realized I could not change in the way they all wanted me to change. I couldn't be a man. So I thought, well, well, what can I do? I mean, what have I got going for me? And I'm a compassionate, motherly type of figure. And many of those men have been raised by their mothers and their grandmothers. And then I'm British, which means that I make a fabulous cup of tea. So I thought, mama, go with what you got. And I, I got permission to take an electric tea kettle behind the walls. And I was determined to use that to build a community behind the razor wire. I made tea on every possible opportunity. On cold winter nights, I'd rush out to the compound where the, where the officers were guarding, and I'd say, officers, officers, may I make you tea? I want to turn you all into Englishmen. <laughs> and they smiled, and eventually they softened.
And then I made tea as many times as possible for the, for the inmates. Now, I brought in many different kinds of tea so they'd have the luxury of choice. There isn't much choice for men in a prison. But I bring in lots of different kinds. And we had regular leadership meetings because with the prayers and help of many volunteers, I was raising up a new leadership team to take the place of the ones that had been shipped out to the other prison. And so I would, as, as the men were gathered, I would make tea and I'd say, Prince, what kind of tea would you like? I must tell you, there was probably about eight men in my tiny office at this point. And I'd say, Prince, what kind of tea would you like? Chaplin, don't you remember? Oh, silly me, of course, yes, yes. You like lemon verbena with two sugars. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, I just have to break out of the story just for a moment. And, and I always said that if I, if I possibly could, I would. I would tell you the name of Prince. Now, normally, I would never, ever tell you the real name or the real nickname of an inmate because they need to go under the radar. But Prince, whose name was Neil Spann, died a few years ago. He was a lifer. And lifers, they want their name to be spoken outside the prison and to be known for something good. And he had a real, he had a real, he fell in love with the Lord. He had a Damascus Road experience and, and really converted not long after he was in the prison. He was in for 30 years um, by the time he died. He wanted people to know f that he, he did do good things, and he did. He trained up generations of young men who were going to get out of prison and really taught them and changed their lives. And he also taught me how to be a chaplain. And so that was Neil Spann. Now, he had a friend who was also a lifer, who was a gardener. And he got permission to bring seeds in, and he planted beautiful gardens. And he'd take the seeds from those flowers and give them to volunteers who he knew would garden. And he'd say, take these and plant them in your own garden so that something of my, my handiwork will bloom in freedom. So that was Neil Spann, and that was his friend. In this story, Neil is known as Prince. So, Chaplin, don't, don't you remember? Oh, yes, I do remember. Of course, Prince. Uh, two, um, you like lemon verbena with two sugars. Yeah, yeah. Manny, what kind of tea would you like? Chaplin, have you forgotten? No, 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 I haven't. You like, um, you like black currant with three sugars. Yeah, 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 you didn't forget. Big Mike, what would you like? Chaplin. <laughs> Let me see. You like, uh, you like chamomile with one sugar. Yeah, yeah, you got that right. I made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cups of tea. But one day things changed. Michelin man, who was known as M.M., was a young man who really loved his mother. And I knew him well because he volunteered in the, the chapel often. And one day his mother was taken seriously ill and whisked off to hospital. And because of the prison regulations, he couldn't call her there. So I gave him a phone call on my private line in my office. And I got through to the nurse's station and I told her what had happened and she must have had somebody in the system. Well, first of all, she told me that his mother had been taken down for an emergency operation. But this is why I think she had someone in the system because incredibly, this has never happened to me before or since, she patched me down to the operating room. His mother was already in the table, on the table with the anesthetic going into her and yet they let her speak to her son. And I heard him say, I love you, Marbird. And he told me very shyly afterwards that she'd said, I love you too. Tweet, tweet. That was their private love code. And that was the last time that M.M. ever spoke to his mother because she died later that night. And he was devastated. And he wasn't eligible to go to the funeral on the outside. And so I bent all sorts of regulations and I told him to give me the names of six of his friends who had known Marbird and I arranged to have a funeral in my office at the same time as the funeral on the outside. And the men gathered and they started to pay tribute to Marbird. One said, well, he said, I'm so glad I knew her on the outside. She was a fabulous cook. I love being invited to your house for dinner. And another said, well, I I'm just, I'm so glad I knew her. She was so kind to me when my mother died. I don't know how I would have got through it otherwise. I I'm never going to forget that. And another said, well, I only knew her here in the visiting room when she was coming to see you and, and I was there. But, but I'll never forget. She always had a kind word for me. And that smile, I'm never going to forget that smile. And then the, man, the men sang Amazing Grace in four-part harmony. 
and my office became holy ground. And then I tried something I didn't know whether they'd go for or not. I had brought in several bottles, small bottles of bubbles that had been left over from my niece's birthday party. And I said, gentlemen, I said, I'm going to pray and commit my bird's spirit to the Almighty. And then why don't we all blow bubbles, signifying her spirit raising from earth to be joined with her Savior in heaven. And so I said the prayer. And then this man, this huge man, bulging with muscles, grabbed a tiny bottle of these bubbles and went, <sighs> blew them and went, goodbye, my bird. And then a man on the other side of the room, completely covered in tattoos, he blew a stream <sighs> and he went, tweet, tweet. And then they all started doing it. They all started blowing bubbles. Goodbye, Marbird, tweet, tweet. Goodbye, Marbird, tweet, tweet. Goodbye, Marbird. My whole office filled up with bubbles. The men didn't want to stop blowing bubbles. It was goofy and real and incredibly honoring. And then I made them all tea with lots of sugar because that's the British cure for shock. Well, news goes around a prison like wildfire. And when I look back, I realize that that was the moment that we became a community that loved and laughed and worshiped together. And I knew that things had changed because of the segregation unit, the seg unit, that's the prison within a prison. Men are locked up there for 23 hours a day. And usually they've got their hands against the bars looking out over to the compound. And they can't call at anyone who walks past. No one is safe, not mothers, not grannies, not ministers. The commissioner walked past one time and someone shouted out, nice rear end, commissioner. Now you understand, that's not exactly the wording that he used. <laughs> <laughs> but the commissioner wasn't phased. He just shouted back, thank you, I've been working out. <laughs> But after that funeral, every time I walked past, there was absolute silence, which was the highest honor that those men could give me. But one time as I was passing, someone did cry out, will you bless us, chaplain? And oh, it was my honor. It was my privilege to pray a blessing over all those men, no matter what faith group they came from. Well, I left the prison about two years after the funeral. My work was done. A very strong leadership team had been raised up for Grace Church, and it is still going now. The church is still going strongly. So my task was done. But when I left, I did feel like that old war horse. I was emotionally battered and bruised and absolutely exhausted. But I learned such a lot from my men. And I discovered something that British women have known for eons. And that is, you can't keep a good mama down, especially not when she makes a killer cup of tea. <laughs> Thank you. And, and as part of this story, I'd like to read you something. Now, when I first went into the prison, the very first time, I was very moved. And so I wrote a poem. And I read it over the men. They loved it. And they would often ask me to read it over them as a blessing. And so I would like, with your permission, to read this poem over you as a blessing. I'm glad I'm seeing some nodding heads. Thank you. It's called Do Not Think. Do not think I have forgotten you, though you dwell in this desolate place. Though cold and gloom encircle you and despair has pushed out grace. The plans I have for you hold true, though all around has changed. Though your hopes and dreams are smashed, destroyed, your future rearranged. For there is destiny upon your life. I have not changed my mind. Your name is scribed upon my palm. You will not be left behind. My training grounds are mine to choose. This one's austere, no light. But from this stark, dank valley, you'll arise to fight my fight. I have called you to the nations. My plans are still in place. This darkness will turn into dawn. Let me hold you. Seek my face. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
<laughs> Tea in the Slammer, a story told for you by storyteller Geraldine Buckley, a story that recounts how she created connections and carved out a space for herself at the largest men's prison in Maryland, even though guards and inmates alike were a little dubious about whether she should even be there. In just a moment, a little talk back with Brian and Heather about that story, followed by an old-time radio drama adaptation of Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Don't miss a single word. It's coming up. I'm Sam Payne. It was just our pleasure to hear a story from Geraldine Buckley, recorded live in the Appleseed studio. The story was Tea in the Slammer, and it comes from, uh, it's just one of the stories that Geraldine Buckley shares about her time as the chaplain in the largest men's prison in Maryland. And to unpack that story a little bit, I'm pleased to be joined around the desk by our producers, Dr. Heather Bigley and Dr. Brian Tanner. Guys, a pleasure to have you with me. Hey, great to be here. Hello. So let's talk about Tea in the Slammer from Geraldine <laughs> Buckley. Where does a story like that take you? Well, it's a great story about a person uh, being a fish out of water and coming into a situation where they're not, ex- nobody's excited about them being there. <laughs> right. And um, what I love is, you know, there's this recognition that she is not who they want, mm. but everybody then you know, decides to work together to create a community, right? They have the grace, she says, to accept her and work for that. And she has the creativity and imagination to come up with a way to really become impactful in their lives. And Mm -hmm. that's just lovely. Yeah, she states it outright, like, I can't be male and I can't be black. Right, (laughs) right. But she's like, I can be a grandmotherly British Presence with my with my tea. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah. And Heather, when you said you know they, they they haven't chosen each other, they're they're not the people that they might choose. Right. I I just thought about families. I mean, yeah. you know, your family is the it, it, they're the people you didn't choose. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. Essentially, and and, and and it can be really hard actually. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, to yeah. feel like you belong there. Oh, good heavens! Wow. <laughs> Kind of got me where I live. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing that I really love about the story is um, the way that she gives them some small piece of autonomy around choosing the kind of tea, right? She just doesn't come in and say, Earl Grey, that's what we drink in England, and that's what we're drinking here. That's what mm-hmm. Captain Picard drinks, <laughs> and so it is the official drink. <laughs> yes. And she allows them to create this identity around something like lemon verbena, right? Yeah. I'm the mm-hmm. lemon verbena drinker. And this isn't about who they were outside, and it was. it's not about what they had done. It's about this is who I am right here in this space and yeah. I can be with you in this space. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, something that I was really touched by in this performance was that poem that she read at the end. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which was so beautiful and it had this uh, idea at its core that you are not forgotten, yeah. you know, and I can see why, obviously, why that would speak to um, prisoners, you know, yeah. that, what about all the people on the outside? Have they forgotten about me? Are they living their lives? Do, mm-hmm. do the, how much do they think about me? Yeah. And but I think all of us can relate, even if we're not in prison. You know, to this feeling of being forgotten. Um, it, uh, when I think of those feelings, I go back to a time when I had whooping cough, mm. oh. pertussis. Wow. Yeah, and I had. There's ju- a 19th century. Experience. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I got it, I was like, "Is whooping?" That's still a thing? What? You know? And it was... And you had scurvy at the same time, I bet. <laughs> Diphtheria. I had them all at the same time. Okay. Uh, but it, uh, my parents had just moved away for a couple of years, and I had agreed to go move into their house. I was in grad school. I came down with whooping cough, and all of a sudden, I was just floored. Like, I would go weeks without li- leaving the house, oh, wow. and there was no one else there, and I was so sick, and I just had these times where I was just like, if I cough myself to death, how many days will it take for them to find my body? Right. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, I, and I felt so utterly alone at times, and... Mm. But... 
You know, there were people in my community who came to check on me. Yeah. And that was, sometimes I would just, guys, I'm getting so depressing here. But sometimes <laughs> I, would, I would look out the window. I would just stare out the window for like an hour, just being like hoping that a human being would pass by because I hadn't seen one in so long. Oh, wow. You know, but I, I was just so glad that the community took it upon themselves to be like, hey, we know that Brian is there. We haven't seen him at church. We haven't seen him around. You yeah. know, let's make sure that he's okay. And after they knew that I had whooping cough, they, they sent regular, kind yeah. of wellness checks on me. And I really, really appreciated that. So I, I I can understand the importance of just feeling like someone out there cares for you. Yeah, yeah. that's well, really lovely. I It reminds me of um, when I brokenly and not very well uh, was part of a group that went and went to church uh, with the prison congregation. And um, here I was with these people who desperately sort of needed to be shown that they weren't forgotten, that they were important, um, not just to me, but to God, right? That's yeah. really why we were there. And so, you know, I remember sitting next to people that I'd help check out of their, um, you know, cell and bring over to the church. And I would think in my head, okay, you need to reach out and hug this person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I know you're not a hugger. You're going to do it anyway, right? Like, and I would like count. Here we go. One, two, three, side hug. I can do a side hug. I'm just going to give a squeeze. Um, and and then feeling like, um, good job. And, and it wasn't me saying that to me. It was, you know, yeah. it was this inspiration saying to yeah. me, you did a good job. Now you have to do it again. Yeah. You have to keep doing that. Yeah. Um, Good so job. Here's more to do. Yeah. Here's yeah. more, and you're going to get better at it yeah. a little bit. You know. <laughs> One of the things I love about every Geraldine Buckley performance is she is a reminder of how how someone can wear on their sleeve the things that are dearest to them. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. I think people of faith find themselves strategizing uh, in, mm. in conversation with other people. Right. How do I wear my faith in a way that will be palatable to the person that I'm talking to? You yeah. Know? And Geraldine Buckley is just irrevocably <laughs> in love with the Lord. Yes. Right? Oh, that's how she, she comes in hot. That yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. Saying yeah. That, yeah. And it's great. Yeah. It's great. I mean, it's it's such a wonderful, uh -huh. warm embrace yeah. that, that yeah. Geraldine Buckley she, presents. She doesn't apologize for it. Yeah. She's, she's not trying to convert you. She's just like, this is who I am. Yeah. You know? but, yeah. Yeah. And that poem is evidence of it, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about it being a reminder that we're not forgotten. When I heard it, it made me think... Even when we have made bad, bad choices in our lives, and all of us probably have experiences where we thought, that is not the choice I should have made. Here, she's taking from the scriptures uh, reminders that God is there with blessings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's going to reach out, and he's going to give you the blessing he promised. You just have to make a little more effort. Just mm. try a little Just try a little more. Um even though you may feel like I destroyed it all, hmm. I burn it all down, yeah. there's still this blessing that God's willing to reach out to you with. Yeah. Well, the story did bring to mind a memory for me that I'd like to share as today's entry of the Radio Family Journal. The Radio Family Journal with Sam Payne. A tiny little story for you and your family. Right when you need it. On the Appleseed. It seems like it's always the way of things, that when you move to a new place, you find yourself a little bit at loose ends until you find something to grab onto that makes you feel at home in your new home. And sometimes the thing you find can take you by surprise. I learned this, or began to, when I left home for college. It was my first time living away from home, and I sort of flailed around for a minute trying to find something that made me feel at home in my new home. And what I found were a couple of terrific hikes that were easy to get to from my dorm room. I also found a Godfather's Pizza about a block away and some friends to go hang out there with. Problem solved, right? I had figured it out. I felt at home. As it turns out, though, that was just a test run for a bigger challenge. After my first year of college, I moved to Argentina. It was for sure the farthest from home I'd ever been. And just as had happened when I went to college, I flailed around for something that made me feel at home in my new home. 
Oddly, the first thing I found was a zoo in the city where I lived. When I was a kid, we used to go to the zoo all the time. I loved the zoo, and here in faraway Argentina, there was a similar zoo, so that helped. But what really made the difference was soccer. In every home, in every town in Argentina, lives a soccer fan. Football, they call it, of course, but it's absolutely ubiquitous. All the kids spent all the hours they weren't in school on the soccer field. All their fathers came home from work each night, changed into their soccer shorts, and gathered in vacant lots and dusty fields to play until the sun went down. Churches built soccer fields adjacent to their buildings and gathered on them often. The church I attended had just such a soccer field. Now, when I lived back home, I was hardly a soccer player. I wasn't even much of an athlete. I'd played baseball for a couple of years on little league teams, where I did okay, but did not particularly distinguish myself. And I had learned to love running when I was a teenager, though there again, I wasn't a first place finisher. I just liked to be out there on the road, moving along. What I was, really, was a reader. Other kids my age had favorite basketball players. I had favorite books. I loved The Princess Bride, for example, with its funny, tender, thrilling story and its exotic denizens like the Turkish giant and the Sicilian villain and the Spaniard swordsman out for revenge. Maybe I satisfied whatever athletic longings I might have had through the strength of the giant physic or the skill and discipline of Inigo the swordsman. In any case, everyone around me in my new Argentina home, and I mean everyone, was playing soccer, and they invited me to join them. And so out onto the field I went. And at first I was a little timid. It probably wasn't embarrassing to be on the field with me, but I was, for sure, no star. No big asset, even, for sure. I felt even more like a fish out of water in a new and strange place. Well, it stayed that way for about half a game. Somewhere in the middle of the second half of the first soccer game I played in Argentina, on the church soccer field, I found myself muttering under my breath something you may find a little ridiculous. If you'd been standing really close to me, you'd have heard me say, Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. I have no idea why that even came into my head. But the next time I charged the ball, I did it with a little more confidence than the last time. Again, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And now I'm like, I'm like an actual presence on the field. Somehow this mantra is kind of working. I keep it under my breath, of course. I'm not interested in the other players thinking I'm bonkers, but over the course of the game, I must mutter those words a hundred times. And I do okay. I, I score a goal. I block some important movement of the other team. I make some key passes that result in good things. To be sure, my mantra doesn't for a second endow me with greater skill on the field, only with a modicum of confidence that didn't at first come with me into the game. And it's enough. It's enough to make me begin to fall in love with soccer. And it lasts pretty much the whole time I lived in Argentina. Though I've been in a hundred situations since then where I've had to get used to something new, a new place, a new skill, a new tool, a new job, new friends. And I know it's a little bonkers, but sometimes in those situations, if you're really close to me, you might just find me muttering, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die. It's often the first step toward finding myself at home in a new home. Radio Family Journal of Sam Payne. A tiny little story for you and your family. Right when you need it, on the Appleseed. Thanks for joining me for that entry in the Radio Family Journal. It's been a pleasure to talk around the desk with Brian and Heather about that story told by Geraldine Buckley in the Appleseed Studio, a story called Tea in the Slammer. Brian, Heather, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us, Sam.
Today, we're listening to stories about making your place in the world, even in those situations in which it seems to you as if the world isn't too excited about you. We've talked about walking into new places, new situations, and finding a place for yourself there. But what if you find yourself in a new place, a new situation that isn't new at all, but rather ancient, I mean really, really old? That's the premise of Mark Twain's novel, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Now, the novel was written in 1889, and it's about a guy who works as a foreman of iron workers in a firearms foundry, meaning he manages 2,000 skilled craftsmen who make guns. Anyway, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court is a time travel story, and in the story, the foreman of iron workers winds up in the British Isles in the 6th century. It's England, but it's England long before England was even England. For Mark Twain, a Connecticut Yankee is a synonym for American, the smartest, savviest, most ingenious kind of American of the time, the kind of American who works hard, thinks clearly, solves problems, an inventor, a skilled technician, and this American travels to England and faces old, old, old world problems like slavery, class oppression, illiteracy, superstition, And because he's a newfangled American with confidence and smarts, well, all the confidence and smarts of 1889, he basically takes over. That's Twain's version of the story. But the Ford Theater, now we say the Ford Theater because it was sponsored by the Ford Motor Company, adapted Twain's novel as a radio drama for the 20th century, and they updated the main character to a World War II veteran instead of an 1889 iron workers foreman. And as the story begins in the radio drama, we meet our protagonist as he's just waking up. He can't remember much. He's been in a fight. That's kind of the last thing he remembers. And as things begin in this version of the story, he figures out pretty quickly that he's pretty far from home and in a heap of trouble to boot. Sit back and enjoy this bit of radio storytelling history. A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court based on the Mark Twain novel and brought to life on the radio in 1947. When I woke up, I was lying on a dirt floor. Above me was a low stone ceiling, and around me were four stone walls, one with a heavy metal door. Before I even had time to be surprised, the door opened and a young guy came in. He was dressed from neck to knees in a pair of shrimp-colored tights, and he carried a crust of bread in one hand and an earthenware mug in the other. Fair sir, will you take sup? Will I which? Will you taste of bread and sip of water therewith to fill thy paunch and slake thy thirst? What what, what kind of talk is that? Where am I? Marry, sir, where wouldst thou be other than in King Arthur's court? Where? King Arthur's court, have you no ears? Say, what kind of joke is this? Wherefore dost thou think it a joke? Listen, I'm talking to a guy in my own backyard. He knocks me out. I wake up in jail. You come in decked out in some kind of costume, spotting some kind of queer language. What word would you use for it except joke? Ah, and uh, dost consider it likewise a joke that thou art to be burned at the stake within the hour? Burned at the stake? What for? Thy strange dress doth proclaim thou art an evil magician. An evil magician? Look, kid, I want to see a lawyer. I know not what meaneth lawyer, and I hight not kid. And it please your worship, I hight Pierre de Beauchamp Bedivere de Boutelet. Pierre de Bush... 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 I'll call you uh, Clarence. Uh, Look, I'd better get the picture as you see it. You say this is King Arthur's court. Wit ye well, and so it be, the glorious Arthur whose golden reign hath blessed us since the year 510. 510? And what year is it now? Why, 528. But what mattereth to thee what year it be since it be thy last day on earth? (laughs) Now, wilt thou come with me in orderly fashion, or must I need summon the guards? I'll come quietly, officer. Anything to find out what this is all about. 
Thou hadst bets chill thine eyes. The glare of the sun is fearsome. Say, what are all those people doing over there in that field? No, sweet Joe Worship, they are come to see thee burn. What? Holy mackerel, you weren't kidding. <laughs> Yonder is the stake. No, this can't be. This must be a nightmare. But I better not take any chances. Uh, uh, Clarence, what time is this bonfire set for? When the sun doth reach its highest point. Noon, huh? Noon, sun. Clarence, what's the date today? The 21st of June. The 21st of June, the year 528. But that's wonderful. Wonderful? Hast taken leave of thy senses, my lord? Clarence, congratulate me. I will not be burned today. <clears throat> I'd remembered something. Something from the days when I used to memorize the almanac to keep from going stir-crazy on those Pacific coral reefs. On that day, there was a total eclipse of the sun. Now, these people apparently believed in magic, and they'd certainly never heard of an eclipse. So I turned to Clarence. Sir? Is, um, is King Arthur in the house? Yonder he sits, under the royal canopy. Ah. Hey there, King Arthur! Speakest thou to me? To nobody else but... I hear you think I'm a magician. So Merlin hath informed me. Who's Merlin? Know ye not of Merlin? It is he who sitteth here upon my right hand. For he be my trusted advisor and the most powerful magician in all the land. And he wants to get rid of me. Afraid of the competition? Nay, he fears not thee nor any man. Is it not so, good Merlin? My gracious liege, I well know the limit of this man's power. He can do naught to harm us. Is that so? Is that so? Listen, King Arthur, if you go through with this barbecue, I'll cook up the worst disaster since Noah's flood. Uh, how say you? I will blot out the sun. Merlin, can he in truth do this thing? He can, Sir King, but he dare not, for it can be done only by calling upon that awful being whose name tis death to pronounce. That's ridiculous. Enough, enough. I believe thee, good Merlin. Tie him to the stake. Okay, if that's the way you want it. You hear that, all you people? Your king has doomed you to destruction. I am going to destroy the sun. Hark as I call forth the forces at my command. Reed, pleat. Zoot, zoot. Hey, bubba, rebub. Mercy, dotes. Bleep, bloop. Hudson Ross in the river. Upon you, O dreaded one, upon you whose name may not be spoken save by the chosen few, on you I call to destroy the sun as I pronounce thine awful and fearful name, Snafu! My timing was on the nose. The crowd went mad with fear. But I wasn't feeling so good either, because I figured to myself, there's no eclipse due on June 21st in 1947. This must be the year 528, and I am in King Arthur's court. Well, there was no help for it. I'd have to make out as best I could. Meanwhile, King Arthur was practically down on his knees pleading with me. Good, sweet, most powerful magician. Bring not this disaster upon the world because of mine own disbelief in thee. Reflect, gracious sir, bring back the sun. Okay, King Arthur, here's my proposition. If I bring back the sun, you appoint me permanent prime minister. My cut will be 10% of any increase in revenue I produce for the state. If I can't live on that, I won't ask for a raise. Is it a deal? Away with his bond! <laughs> Rich and poor shall do him homage. Here's the king's right hand and is clothed with full power and authority. Now, good sir, sweep away the night and bring the light again. Let the enchantment dissolve and pass harmless away. Open the door, Richard! <laughs> so how's that for an adventure? Hank Morgan having escaped death by burning at the stake because he somehow had enough free time when he was in the army to memorize the date when a solar eclipse might have happened in the year 520. 
28. And if that's not enough, Hank's show of what looks to everyone like magic not only saves his skin, but gets him a gig as prime minister in Arthur's kingdom and 10% of the kingdom's revenue as well. People start calling him not by his name, Hank, but by the title Sir Boss. Hank makes enemies, of course, and chief among them are Merlin and the Knights of the Round Table, oddly. But not even his worst enemies can stand up to the inventions and industry brought to the kingdom by Hank's Yankee know-how. And there's even a kind of montage of things that Hank brings to the kingdom. And if this list seems a little far-fetched, it's not much more far-fetched than the idea of traveling in time back to the 6th century in the first place. Place, right? King Arthur, I've shown you folks a lot of magic since I've been here, but today you're going to see a form of magic that tops everything. Black magic? Or white magic, Sir Boss? Scientific magic, Merlin. See here. Sir Boss, what is this? This is an automobile assembly line. What signifieth automobile? That's one right there. He's likened to the chariot of the Prince of Darkness. It's a chariot, all right. It moves at many times the speed of a horse. Faster than my horse? Much faster. Of course, this is only a Model T. In another ten years, we'll be able to make a Lincoln. Now, if you'll step into this next room. Nate, it's black as night, sir, boss. Merlin, bring light. You won't need a torch, King Arthur. Just push this little button. So. Ah. Wondrous light. It is brighter than the sun. That is but one of the powers of electricity, King Arthur. Ah, it is an old enchantment. Oh, it has other uses. Uh, here, Merlin. Pick up this wire. There's some mischief, I trow. Walter not, Merlin. Seize it. Sir Boss, thou hast slain him. Nah, he's just knocked out. Could have happened to anybody who was changing a fuse. What is in this box, Sir Boss? Reach out and turn the knob, King Arthur. Have no fear. Turn the knob. Yes. <clears throat> Camelot is the armor for you. C A M E L O T. No, no, no. Recall the charm, Sir Nate is enough. You uh, don't care for the radio? Uh, methinks tis a mixed blessing. Sir Boss, I have seen most marvelous things this day. Truly, thou art the greatest magician the world has ever seen. King, you ain't seen nothing yet. Look up at the sky. Ah, oh, a huge bird. Nope, an airplane. Watch. How would you like to ride in that, King Arthur? Ah, methinks to be a great adventure. Hast thou not taught me this day there is no danger in these things? Well, it takes a little time to learn to manage them. Then I will take the time to learn. And all my people shall learn. And then will each night... Ride upon an automobile, and every castle shall have light and heat and a radio, and each night an electric razor. <laughs> a list of some of the things that time-traveling Hank Morgan brings to the kingdom of King Arthur. Automobiles, electric light, radio, airplanes, and there's more. He introduces them to something else, too. And this is one of my favorite parts of this radio story, by the way. As it turns out, there's no reason why America's national pastime can't be the national pastime at King Arthur's court, right? Steer! Thou oh, liar's name of an umpire! Twas a ball if ever I did see one! Beware! Launcelot, steal a pound! Slide, Launcelot! Slide! Cease thy mutterings ere I send thee to the showers. Play ye ball! <laughs> Beware, Lancelot stealeth home. And you get to hear Lancelot's tin-plated feet running toward home as the knights play baseball in full armor. 
I love it. And pretty soon in Camelot, there's an elementary school in every village and a high school, too. And there's a university being planned. And it all seems to have come effortlessly to Hank Morgan, the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Of course, our Connecticut Yankee can't stay forever at King Arthur's court, and Merlin finally strikes back, causing a war. It's kind of tough. There are death and disease and despair, and our Americans' eventual return to 20th century America. And that's the story of a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, at least the version of it made for the radio in 1947 by the Ford Theater, sponsored by the Ford Motor Company. The original novel by Mark Twain is similar stuff, minus the cars and airplanes and radio, maybe. That little adventure with radio history comes with a question, a storytelling invitation, maybe. If it weren't Hank Morgan who headed back to the ancient days of Camelot, but rather you, what might you want to show the people you met? What new ideas and virtues might you want to teach the folks at King Arthur's court? What might be difficult for you as you made your way in that ancient land? As you think about that, you might find yourself stumbling on some good ideas that you could use not on an imaginary visit to Camelot, but right now in the world in which you currently live to make life better for the people around you. That's what storytelling can do. You might find that you're just as good at thinking about solving the problems of today as Mark Twain was about imagining the Yankee management of the problems of an ancient yesterday. Well, it's been a pleasure to be with you this hour on The Apple Seed, where great stories can change your world. We're pleased and proud to be among the many shows in the BYU Radio family of programs. And you can find this episode or any episode from our archive on the BYU Radio app, at byuradio.org slash Appleseed or by Googling the Appleseed podcast. In the meantime, we wish you luck in finding your place in the world. And if it comes along with a great story, we'd love to hear it. Reach out to us at theappleseed at byu.edu. And if you're discovering us on the podcast, feel free to rate us and leave us a review. It helps other people find the show. And along those lines, many thanks to On Bright Street, a reviewer on Apple Podcasts, who said the Appleseed is a dream of a storytelling podcast, a real pleasure. It's warm, thoughtful, funny, diverse, intelligent, and this is a great choice for adults and children alike and a sweet family listen. Thanks for enriching my life. I'm telling you, on Bright Street, I can't tell you how happy we are to hear that you're enjoying the show. So grateful you're listening. I'm Sam Payne, and I can't wait to be with you again on The Appleseed. Seed.